Great. Well, hello, everyone, and it's very nice to see you all. Uh, thanks for your patience while we got the hybrid um, technology sorted out. And welcome to everyone who's joining us online as well. My name is Paul Anderson. I'm uh, acting uh, director of the Centre of Islamic Studies this year, and it's my great pleasure to uh, start this uh, seminar series, which will run every two weeks, uh, by uh, welcoming uh, Roger Hardy. Actually, Roger is a friend of the Centre of Islamic Studies. He uh, gave a talk uh, back in 2017 uh, on his previous book, The Poisoned Well, Empire and its Legacy in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, uh, Roger worked with the uh, BBC um, as a political analyst, as a Middle East analyst with the World Service uh, for more than two decades, and is currently uh, a fellow, an associate fellow with Green Templeton uh, College at the University of Oxford. He's the author of three books. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, The Poisoned Well, uh, published in 2016. Um, incidentally, this is a book which also, um, you know, like his current most recent book, also draws heavily on, uh, on images, a wonderful sort of archive of more than 30 images uh, which, uh, which begin the book. It's a book about uh, the independence movements across the Middle East and the, uh, the effect of empire on uh, societies in that, in that period. And I believe it started with a radio series um, when you interviewed uh, free officers, among others, mm -hmm. and colonial administrators. So really drawing heavily on oral uh, testimonies and oral history. Um, also uh, the author of The Muslim Revolt, A Journey Through uh, Political Islam, uh, in 2010 with Columbia University Press. And then most recently, uh, the book, uh, The Bride, uh, an illustrated history of uh, Palestine uh, published uh, last year. And this uh, tells a story of Palestine uh, over a hundred years, again, using oral history and drawing uh, heavily on uh, photographs, more than 120 uh, photographs. It's won praise from academics and Middle East correspondents alike and I just mentioned the uh, citation of Professor Eugene Rogan at Oxford, uh, a stunning book that captures the modern history of Palestine. So Roger, we're delighted that you uh, can join us and uh, we'll uh, invite Roger to speak for around 40, 45 minutes and then have time for questions. Thank you very much and thank you all of you. Um, I'm, I don't know whether Professional historians would accept a category called journalist historian, but I'm a journalist historian. What does it mean? I summarize, I synthesize, I, I summarize, I popularize, I humanize. And the, the normal way in which a journalist would try and humanize a story is by having real flesh and blood human beings. Not always easy in a historical narrative, but if you use vivid, vivid diaries, letters, and words, you can bring those characters to life. And I tried to do that in the previous book, as Paul mentioned. This book started the same way, but got hijacked along the way. Uh, I, I thought of doing a journalist's oral history of Palestine, and I thought of doing it really for the period of British rule, which is the period people often take the 30 year period of British rule. But both of those things changed. And I kept coming across photographs that I thought were great photographs and I'd never seen them in the literature. Now this is an oceanic literature on Palestine, Israel. Uh, uh, and they were pictures. And this is what it led me to believe that I can put these two resources as they call them, oral history and photography on the same plane in the sense that photographs too are a form of evidence, are a form of testimony. Uh, I wish and I would appeal to historians to try and see photography in that light. I think oral history has been integrated in mainstream history. Photography has definitely not been integrated in mainstream history in the same way. There are all sorts of reasons for, for that, and they're good reasons. And phot photography, as I quickly discovered, brings its own set of challenges, some of which you're going to hear about. But it, the two resources, as they call them, tell us not only what happened, but what it felt like to be there. But both sources need contextualization. The biggest single challenge I faced was how to, to provide the right context for the pictures. And some of that you're going to hear about uh, this evening. 
the bride, I took the visual idea, the visual image of Palestine as a bride with many suitors. And when you think about it, this makes Palestine distinct from, let's say, Egypt. The British wanted Egypt, it had a strategic value, but they didn't want to kind of embrace it, hold it as a suitor uh, wants to do and deny anybody else, uh, you know, uh, then they didn't write poems in, in, in honor of Egypt, in, in praise of this beautiful woman called Egypt or this beautiful thing called Egypt. But Palestine really was perceived as the Holy Land. And I'm going to talk in this early phase about Christian views of Palestine. Because the, uh, the other thing I learned was that the story doesn't begin with the First World War. And Allenby arrives and goes into Jerusalem and 30 years of British history, British rule of Palestine begin. It doesn't even begin in the 1880s when Zionist settlement gets underway. Both of those are familiar starting points for people who want to tell the story. It begins at least half a century earlier, the late 1830s. And as it happens, this is when photography of Palestine gets going as well. There's, there's some linkage here. Why? Because Palestine around the 1830s and around the middle of the 19th century is opened up. Uh, the West um, arrives in Palestine in all sorts of shapes and forms and arrives with a kind of religious imperialism as part of the, its motivation. Who do I mean? In terms of power, the consuls arrive in Jerusalem. Uh, I won't try and tell the story of how that came about. The, the Ottoman rulers of Palestine were not happy with the power the, that these consuls acquired in Jerusalem. They became, as Bernard Wasserstein puts it, quasi-colonial rulers. And they all wanted their bit of Palestine. And they used the religious, uh, the different Christian sects in Palestine as a, as a sort of power base. So France and Italy present themselves as the protectors of Catholics, Britain and Prussia of the Protestants, Russia and Greece of the Orthodox. They create uh, a lot of, uh, and there's huge rivalry between them. And this is not a conventional imperial uh, occupation of Palestine. I call it imperial, or in other words, Western encroachment on Palestine. And the Ottoman Turks felt it as being encroachment. And because of the rivalry between these different groups, which is very well known, uh, th this created what, the, what Edward Lear rather nicely called Jerusalem squabble poison. Uh, I think you need a sort of Rowan Atkinson uh, accent to, to, to get do justice to squabble poison. But Edward Lear, of course, was not just the, the poet and writer, but was a traveler and a very accomplished uh, painter who knew Palestine very well. So you had an army beginning really around the 1840s and 1850s, and an army of consuls, missionaries, archeologists, explorers, and a little, little bit later, tourists, mass tourists, including Mark Twain, who famously sent up a whole business of religious, the religious package tour in his wonderful book, The Innocents Abroad. All of them imbued with what we could call the dream of Jerusalem, and all of them, Virtually all of them, I'm making a big generalization, but virtually all of them convinced that they, that, they, that they, the Christian West, had a better claim to Palestine than the people who actually lived there, the Arabs, or the people who were ruling uh, Palestine at the time, the Ottoman Turks. Photography, the early photography happens in this context. This is what... Uh, This is what the early photography was about. Christian Europeans taking pictures for other Christian Europeans. And what do they favor? They favor the Christian sites. The, top, the dominant physical image in the picture, the highest point is the cross. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the old wall, the old Ottoman wall of, of, of the old city of Jerusalem. Figures are not very important for the early photographers. Uh, uh, bricks and mortar, or the ruins of bricks and mortar are what matters. Biblical sites are what matter. Does anybody know who took this picture? Or when it was taken? It's, a rough, it's about the 1870s, we don't have an exact date. 
And it's the Frenchman, Félix Bonfils, B-O-N-F-I-L-S, Bonfils, who came with his family to Beirut and established a studio and became the first commercially successful photographer. Uh, because photography initially was not, you couldn't make a lot, you couldn't make a living from photography initially. And what he, uh, what he did um, and was very successful. Um, but my argument is that um, photography was an intrinsic part of the colonial encounter. Not just that Europeans were taking pictures for other Europeans, but the camera itself, and I quote here, it was the introduction of an unknown instrument brought by a stranger into a closed society. This is from Yesha Yadli Nier in one of the pioneering books in a fairly tiny literature. I, I found it a great struggle to get the literature to tell me the, what journalists call the backstory of the pictures, the background to the pictures. But his book, The Bible and the Image, appeared in 1985. And interestingly, he was very much influenced by Edward Said's notion of Orientalism. We're going to we'll come to that very directly in a moment. So the early photographers tended to be to see Palestine, I'm exaggerating slightly, as a landscape with ruins, a biblical landscape with biblical ruins. That's why it matters. That's why the Holy Land was the Holy Land. But they did eventually turn their attention to people. And what they produced were crude caricatures replete with the cultural prejudices of the age. Now, this also is Bonfils, but you won't see his signature there. Uh, there may be, a, may be reasons for this. This was one of the most widely distributed and most widely pirated photographs. In the book, I use it in black and white. I'd be amazed if you hadn't seen it at some time in your life. But you might not have been particularly aware of it. You might have thought, oh, well, you know, one of those pictures of a woman with a tall hat. And she is as fake as the stage props which surround her. The rock is papier mache, the, the greenery is all fake. The French caption is more interesting than an English caption. In, in English, we'd say young woman of, of Bethlehem, but teep. Type de jeu femme de Bethlehem. How they loved their types, the Orientalists, the, the pigeonhole categories, the type de juif, type de druze, type de Libanais, type, de, type of everything. Um, she's been doled up, she's been made up. Uh, by the way, the, you, all the pictures were taken in black and white, uh, but Bonfils, uh, th these pictures sold like hot cakes. Bonfils and the Bonfils family enterprise made lots of money. Down the bottom, it says PZ, Photo Globe Zurich, another Rowan Atkinson uh, uh, phrase, but um, you sent your pictures to Switzerland, to Zurich, and they were color, for color processing. And this made them even more popular and even more lucrative. There was even, and of course, this is Orientalism, and there was even a kind of Orientalist soft horn. If the last the first picture was, as it were, upmarket Bonfils, respectable Bonfils, uh, biblical site, the Garden of Gethsemane, this is downmarket Bonfils. These early photographers saw Palestine as a kind of biblical drama of their own making. And the people of Palestine, insofar as they were interested in them at all, were kind of extras in this biblical drama. It's a wonderful picture in a sense. It takes me back to Sunday school classes. I don't know if any of you remember, you may have seen them in libraries, the very simple pictures. Palestine was, was uh, filled with you know, young shepherd boys like this. I think especially the Sunday school books for children, they thought the young shepherd boy kids could identify with him. We don't always know the backstory of these pictures, how the pictures were taken, uh, even if we know who took them. But in this case, we do. This is the famous uh, uh, American colony photographic studio in Jerusalem, uh, from which I drew many of the pictures of, for my, my book. And the leading photographer was the Swede, uh, Louis uh, Larsen. They'd come to Jerusalem uh, wait to, uh, to, to await the second coming. 
um, but uh, they were cranky, eccentric, even their millennialism was not the classic millennialism. Uh, they're famous today because the American Colony Hotel is the building where they eventually uh, settled outside the walls of the old city. But their lasting achievement, in my view, is to have created an archive. The surviving archive is about 30,000 images of Palestine from the 1880s to the 1940s. It's unique. But of course, it's colored by the fact that they were part of a Christian fundamentalist uh, enterprise. Lawson provided the pictures for an article uh, in the early 20th century, 1911, 1912, for National Geographic. National Geographic in the United States was the place to be if you were a photographer. Little Palestine is still a backwater. You won't make your name in Palestine. You have to be in Paris or London or, or New York or Washington. And his, one of his colleagues, John Whiting in the American Colony, wrote the text. With some difficulty, I managed to get hold of the actual uh, text now from, from the National Geographic of those years. So this is pre-First World War. Palestine was actually in the throes of change. All sorts of things are about to happen even before the First World War. But this picture presents the unchanging Palestine. And the idea behind it is that Palestine hasn't really changed since biblical times. It was a myth, but a lot of people wanted to believe this myth. And the idea was that behind the shepherd boy, you know, Jesus himself might pop out from behind a bush at any moment. It was a myth, uh, but it was a potent myth. And the American colony, too, made a great deal of money from photography. They, they created this unique archive. Flawed with this notion, the scholars now call this the biblical lens, that you, ever, you look at Palestine through an exclusively and really very narrow biblical lens. But the same guy, Louis Larson, depicted what I call real people doing real work. This is not a biblical fantasy. This is not Orientalist make-believe. He knew Arabic. He knew Palestine well. It was a small place, but he knew how to go around. He acted as a tour guide among his many other characteristics. These are the people of a village, women and the children, as the men, mostly the men on top, they're handing them the materials to finish the, the roof for a typical stone village house. Now the same Louis Larson, chief photographer of the American Colony Studio, produces this early 1900s. And for the first time, I, they, I don't think they sold as well as you a picture of, you know, uh, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, picture of the Christian sites in Nazareth and Jerusalem. This is what sold. And the American colony made a great deal of money. But they were there. They took these pictures. Um, and very vivid they are. They, they provide us with a record of what uh, of aspects, anyway, of village life at that time. I've already hinted that um, the big change, the Big Bang, was about to happen, the First World War. And I'm not, I'm giving you bits of potted history, but I'm going to assume you know that the Middle East was totally, not just Palestine, but the whole Middle East is completely transformed by the fact that uh, the Ottomans took, joined the war on the side of Germany and lost. I mean, that's the bottom line is they, that they lost and the Ottoman Empire collapsed. But this is 1915. The Ottomans send one of the triumvirates, the young triumvirate of young Turks, Jamal Pasha, otherwise known as the Butcher, uh, to, to rule Syria and Palestine during the war. This is 1915. Jamal Pasha recruited photos, in, photographers, including Louis Larson, who I've mentioned, and including the first Arab photographer of Palestine. He signs himself C. Raad, R. W. A. D. But we know him as Khalil Rahad, Lebanese origin, but the first Arab photographer of Palestine, the first to start a studio in Jerusalem. Christian Arab, all the early photographers were Christian, the local photographers. They were either Armenians, some of them were Greeks, some of them were Arab Christian. And he's doing what Jamal Pasha told him to do. My German is not very good, but it translates as. Uh, Muslim volunteers setting out from Jerusalem, 1915. Uh, why Muslim? They are Arab vol volunteers, quote unquote. Every single word has to be put in inverted commas. You've been press ganged uh, to join the Ottoman army. Many of them will die, many of them will desert, many of them will catch terrible diseases. 
Uh, and here at the bottom, this was used in a, in a German newspaper, and then they made photo postcards. I call this the serendipity of research. I found it in Wikimedia Commons. You all know Wikipedia. I hope you will know or get to know Wikimedia, which puts images, all sorts of images in the public domain, and was hugely useful to me. So I found this quite by chance. And the census marks being passed by the wartime German censor, so, so at the bottom. And goodness, what fanfare! The, the census that the, you know they declared the war as a jihad, and the census that the whole Muslim world is rising up to support the, the German and Ottoman war effort, and that everybody is behind the war effort. I'm not quite sure what all these children are doing, but it's uh, it's an extraordinary picture. And Rahad, I, I don't blame him for taking the doing propaganda work for Jamal Pasha. If Jamal told you to take pictures, you took pictures, and the alternative was not pleasant. And what a good photography is, how brilliantly he, he portrays it. It's not only uh, propaganda, it's very good uh, propaganda from the point of view of uh, uh, Jamal Pasha. So this was 1950, Muslim volunteers, so-called setting off from, from Jerusalem. The key thing politically and strategically about the war was that it paved the way for the division of the Middle East between the British and the French. General Allenby marches into uh, Jerusalem on foot in 1917, the famous picture, which is such a cliche picture, I deliberately did not use it in the book, but ushering in what I call the Palestine Raj, the 30 years of British rule. One of my favorite pictures because it, it sort of typifies the official British official term and the formality of it. This was the second High Commissioner, Lord Plumer, in the 1920s, and he's widely thought to have been the model for Colonel Blimp, the cartoon character who also became the, the, also the title of a very popular film that you occasionally see uh, today, uh, made by Powell and Pressburger. And this was kind of, this was and very blimpish he looks. Uh, this is his French counterpart on a visit, uh, the, the High Commissioner of Syria and Lebanon. And this is Plumer's little uh, grandson, and behind them is government, the, the initial government house that they uh, used. Of course, the first uh, and most important uh, High Commissioner from the Zionist point of view and from the point of view of Zionism as a project was Herbert Samuel. Um, and under Samuel, uh, Samuel had been one of the prime movers behind the Balfour Declaration. All of you know what the Balfour Declaration was, but with purposeful vagueness, the Alpha Declaration referred to a Jewish national home in Palestine that Britain would support, would facilitate the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine on condition, and this condition was added by Lord Curzon, who was deeply unhappy about the Alpha Declaration, that nothing should be done to prejudice the rights of, quote, existing non Jewish communities in Palestine. In other words, very odd way of describing the Arab majority. And that essential contradiction, which is what it was, was never resolved in the 30 years that followed the issuing of the Balfour Declaration. With Zionist settlement came Zionist photography. I always want to go, hi ho, hi ho, it's off to work we go. I think they're actually coming back from work rather than going off to work. And if you see a touch of sort of Soviet realism here, you are not mistaken. This is the 1930s now. British rule has established itself. Zionist settlement is establishing itself. Tel Aviv is established as an all-Jewish uh, city, close by to Jaffa, a kind of rival to, to Jaffa. And in the 30s, as exiles from Hitler's Germany, they were unable to work as photographers in Berlin then, were people like Zoltan Kluge. The two key figures in my research, and I would never have guessed this even a couple of years ago when I was working on the written part of the text, were Louis Larson, who I've mentioned in the American colony, because he was so prolific. And one of the most prolific of the Zionist photographers, Dalton Kluger. 
this is a settlement near Jaffa, this is 1935. And again, we know little bits of the backstory. Uh, Pluger was not happy to be in Palestine. He was not anti-Zionist. I think we can say he was Zionist, but working for official Zionist institutions as he did, principally the Jewish National Fund, which bought land and started building settlements for, for, for Jews to come to Palestine. It was the only way he could make a living. Photography was not a commercial enterprise and newspapers and magazines were not sufficiently uh, well up and running to make it viable. And unless you had brilliant connections, you couldn't easily sell your pictures to the people who mattered in New York or London or Paris. So we know from, inter from an interview that I found that uh, Kluger remarked to a friend, the settlers, are, in reality, the settlers were dying from malaria. They were tired and morose. And he was tired of uh, the fact that he was required to take pictures of smiling pioneers. So for a moment, you get a glimpse behind what the photographer apps had thought. Um, but this was very successful propaganda and its purpose was to attract immigrants and funds to the Zionist cause. These pictures would be sent to Europe and North America uh, and they had an effect. Kluger really created a kind of iconography of the Zionist pioneers uh, and, uh, and his pictures were, were very widely used and you'll, you'll hear a bit more about Kruger. Grievances, again, I'm sorry, sorry this is very abbreviated potted history, but I'm moving to, to photographs rather than telling a, 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 you know, a detailed account of the history. The grievances over land and immigration <laughs> especially when immigration really grew substantially in the, the 1930s under the fourth High Commissioner, Sir Arthur Wachop. You have to be a Scot to, to get the name right, but it's something like Wachop, um, who was the longest serving, really for most of the 1930s, Wachop served for two terms, most of them served only one term. And this uh, sense of grievance provoked the Arab rebellion of 1936 to 1939, which the British crushed, crushed with great brutality. This is Janine in 1938. The picture, the photography is probably not Larson, but the successor studio. I won't go into it, but the American colony, always full of rivalries and bitterness and money problems and sexual problems and all sorts of things, uh, split up in the 30s. And the photographic agency went to a guy called Matson. That's why really rather misleadingly, it's known today as the Matson, the Eric Matson uh, collection housed in the Library of Congress. All in apple pie order. It's an absolute dream for any researcher. You, you can download them at low resolution, high resolution, you, and you, you don't have to pay them. I mean, it doesn't get any better. So this was probably Matson and young uh, Palestinian photographers now, uh, and gradually you get Palestinian, you get local photographers who are not uh, not necessarily uh, Christian. Uh, you get Muslim and Christian photographers, and you get some women photographers. I have in the book. I haven't got it in front of for you now. The some of the pictures by uh, Karima Aboud whose studio was in Nazareth. And now we have the first, and she was one of the first women uh, photographers in the Middle East, never mind all in Palestine. But this shows very vividly the collective, the sort of collective punishment. The British would come and they would accuse someone in this house or possibly the neighboring house of being a rebel or supporting the rebels or having arms, and you blow up the house. Do you feel the beat of the sun? That sharp, unique sunlight of Palestine, I haven't mentioned it until now, was a great gift to the painters who came before the photographers and to the photographers, the sharp contrast between light and shade you feel in many of the, 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 the photographs. The, by the eve of the Second World War, the rebellion had been broken. The British used uh, torture, including a form of waterboarding. They used, they used this kind of collective uh, punishment. 
The latest research by a very good researcher, Matthew Hughes, suggests that uh, 6,000 Arabs were killed in the Arab Rebellion, a higher figure than we'd seen previously. Um, with the war in Europe looming, Britain issued a, basically did a U-turn, issued a white paper pledging that Jewish immigration and land purchases would be severely limited, and that a binational state, still it was not an Arab state, not envisaged as an Arab state, but that what was envisaged as a binational state, but with an Arab majority, would be created within 10 years. The Zionists, uh, not surprisingly, hated the white paper. They saw it as a betrayal of the Balfour Declaration policy, but they badly needed Britain to win the war against Hitler. So ambivalence doesn't begin to describe their attitude towards Britain at this point. When I got to the Second World War, I, I, without any intention on my part, I discovered I'd written a chapter about propaganda. Uh, all sorts of propaganda, uh, British propaganda, Zionist propaganda, and American propaganda in support of Zionism. In a very strange way, from virtually all of the war, Palestine was an oasis of calm. It was where British troops in Egypt, for example, they wanted to escape the heat from Egypt. They came for a bit of R&R &R, uh, in uh, Palestine. The climate is different. Uh, in, in the very first days of the war, the, German, the Italians tried to bomb, the Italians did bomb Haifa and Tel Aviv, people were killed, but, but that was at the very beginning of the war. After that, Palestine was an oasis of calm, and because the British wanted all sorts of things, uh, warehouses, bases, uh, and goods and services of every kind, Palestine prospered, the Arabs and the Jews uh, of Palestine prospered during the period of war. It was a very unreal time. But at the same time, everybody knew that the problem might be the Palestine problem, the Israeli Arab problem might be in abeyance, but it was still there simmering below the surface. This is a piece of propaganda from New York dating from 1940, a very well known cartoonist or caricaturist called Arthur Schick. And he's saying, help this Jewish man and Jewish woman to build a Jewish army and to, in other words, to fight for a Jewish uh, state. It looked very Jewish to, to me. I think he had his image of what a soldier should look like. So I, I find it a very odd. Or you could, if you told me that they were uh, British members of the British army fighting in the Middle East, that was, I wouldn't dispute it. But this was, this signaled that America had now entered the equation. America had not been a, a party, so to speak, to the Palestine problem. But now it was, and it was a sign that the five million strong Jewish community in the United States would now become uh, actors in that Palestine drama. In Palestine itself, some 30,000 Jews joined the British army, gaining military experience that was later to stand them in good stead, in very good stead when they came to their war for their state in 1948 and 49. And the British also recruited Arabs, which is much less well known. And they recruited uh, the number that's difficult to find out how many Arabs joined. Uh, many Arabs were very unwilling to fight on, for the power that was occupying their country and the power that had issued the Balfour Declaration. But some were largely young men from the villages and largely for economic reasons, as far as I could tell from my research, and a few hundred Arab women including the remarkable Aja Halabi. Her full name is Anastasia Halabi, uh, daughter of a Russian uh, mother and an Arab uh, father. Uh, her sister, Sophie Halabi, a distinguished artist, has a very good biography of her, which also told me quite a lot about the two sisters. Um, she, women fought not in combat roles, but as uh, uh, drivers or nurses and so on, and Aja, and they were then sent to Egypt. So Aja drove trucks around in Egypt in the desert war. It was not a soft option, um, a remarkable woman. After the war, the, the problem had by now been, uh, of course, the, with the, this curious, unreal situation of the war had gone, and so the dynamics of the Palestine problem reasserted themselves, as it were, but with a different cast of characters on the stage. The United States was one of the main players now, 
Soviet Russia was becoming a, main, a, a player with an interest in, the, in, in, in world affairs generally, the United Nations had just been born and took over control of what were the mandated territories, including uh, Palestine. Um, and the Labour government that came in uh, had to deal with, uh, they were really under pressure from without and from within, from without, from Harry Truman's America, which was staunchly pro-Zionist and gave them a very hard time. And in Palestine itself, from the Irgun, uh, led by a man called Menachem Begin, whom you may have heard of lately, later to become a prime minister of Israel, who launched a campaign of violence starting in 1944, even before the war had ended, which really culminated in terms of violence anyway, culminated in the bombing of the King David Hotel in July 1946. This is July, the heat of the Middle East in summer, and they're looking for bodies. Uh, to me, the pressure, I don't know, can you feel it? The, the sense of heat and the wretchedness of, of trying to find uh, bodies from uh, inside, in, you know, the, the rubble. Why was it chosen? Because it had been, the British had chosen, wisely or unwisely, to make it the civilian and military headquarters of their administration, which made it for Begin a target. One of my favorite stories from the bombing uh, of King David, which is totally politically incorrect, let me give you a health warning in advance, is that after two days or even three days, a voice was heard from below the rubble and a policeman said, are you awoke? And the voice came back saying, yes, awoke called Thompson. Thompson uh, looked as if he'd survived for almost three days under the rubble brought him to the hospital and the following day he died of shock. But Arabs and Jews and Egyptians and Syrians were wogs. Uh, this was a common, even if you look at the correspondence of Club Pasha, who was considered so close to the Arabs, especially to the Bedouin. The Egyptians are chippos, and from time to time, Arabs are wogs. This was the language of the time. And that is, taken, if you're interested in the, who the photographers were, again by the Matson Photo Service, the, the successor to the American colony uh, photographers. So this was probably taken by Eric Matson himself, another Swede who learned his craft from Louis Larson. The British had fought and suppressed brutally an Arab revolt in the 1930s, and they now were faced with a Jewish revolt. And given what Hitler had done to the Jews in Europe, they could not use similar methods of what the world would see as similar methods of harsh suppression uh, in Palestine. And they had a real problem on their hands. They were reluctant to, to, uh, to, to resort to martial law, but on occasion they did. This is a photographer called Hans Pin, P I W N, who was another of these refugees from Hitler's Germany, was a German, Kluger Hungarian. Very good, they were professional photographers. And the trick is often to get a distance. You go up in a building or you look down from a window. And these are British soldiers trying to control movement in and out of Tel Aviv, or probably it's that scene between Tel Aviv and Jaffa. Uh, and a very vivid picture it is. And these operations had strange code names. This was Operation Elephant. By now, 100,000 British troops were occupying a country the size of Wales. It beggars belief, and the taxpayers back in Britain were surely could be forgiven for saying, for what? Um, and the soldiers, if you think about it, some of them, especially the Red Berries, who were the, in Europe had been the airborne uh, troops. The, the Zionists called them um, poppies, but they're supposed that they're red heads and they're supposedly black hearts. So they were nicknamed the poppies by the, the Jewish community. Uh, they felt that in Europe they had saved the Jews. They'd gone into the, concent the, the, the concentration camps and liberated them. And here, the Jews of Palestine were describing them as Nazis, were blowing them up, were shooting them, were assassinating them in their officers' clubs, and uh, treating them with absolute contempt. 
it was pretty much unsustainable and, and Bevin and Adley and co reached the conclusion by about 1947 that it was unsustainable. They referred the issue to the United Nations, which in 1947, after extraordinary scenes of, of arm twisting, vote buying, uh, the General Assembly voted for the partition of Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state. Uh, not to put too fine a point on the story, by May, the middle of May 1948, British rule ended in chaos and violence. Ben Gurion, I don't think I've mentioned until now that the, the guy Weizmann handled the diplomacy, Ben Gurion handled the growth of Jewish settlement on the ground in Palestine. Um, ben Gurion was as ruthless as Weizmann was as skillful uh, as a diplomatist. Um, ben Gurion declared the birth of the State of Israel and the neighboring Arab states invaded Palestine, Palestine to prevent partition. They were very clear. The, the, what took uh, uh, Israelis regard this first Arab, this was the first Arab Israeli war, 948, 1949. Israelis regarded as their war of independence, quote unquote. Palestinians regarded as the Nakba, the catastrophe, from which Israel emerged victorious with more than three quarters of Palestine and roughly half the Arab population of Palestine either fled or were expelled. One of my great surprises during this research was that some of the most, I think, extraordinary pictures of the Nakba, including expulsion, including looting, which was widespread and almost never punished by Ben Gurion, were made by official Israeli photographers. Before 1948, they'd worked for official Zionist organizations. After 1948, they worked for official Israeli organizations. And I kept scratching my head, why were they there? Why would they take an extraordinary picture like this? If you've seen these anti-tank barriers are sadly very topical now because of the war in Ukraine. This was a, a Hungarian born photographer called Paul Goldman. I'd be surprised if any of you have ever heard of him and I had never heard of him perhaps two or three years ago. This scene, is of what are usually called the women of Tantura. Tantura, a coastal village where there was a massacre, it was ferociously argued over in Israel. And uh, the people or the civilians of Tantura were moved around to different places and eventually brought by a bus. There is the bus. Here is Israeli controlled territory. Over here is Tulkarim, what we now call the West Bank, in other words, Jordanian controlled territory at that time. And they got out of the bus and they're told that way. It's an extraordinary photograph, I think, because whereas other photographs focus in the classic refugee shots on the refugees, understandably, the faces and the women carrying their belongings, here you have this brute metal jag, you know, thrusting up towards them in a sort of threatening manner. Now, I, to me, it is one of the most moving and striking and powerful images of in most cases, these images by Israeli official photographers working for official Israeli organizations were not published. They languished in files and some of them disappeared. They just deteriorated or people got rid of them, whatever. But this one was used. In the, the newspaper, Davar, the newspaper of the trade union movement had a weekly which photographers liked and it appeared in the Davar weekly in, in 1948, and the caption was changed. Goldman's chapter, I checked this as carefully as I could, said women and children expelled from Birburin. Tantura was their original home, but Birburin was the crossing point. And they changed the caption to read, Arab women and their children were returned to Arab territory. Oh, well, that's all right, isn't it? Arab returned. And I only know this because Goldman's work was saved. There was an exhibition of his work and with some difficulty, I got hold of the catalog of the exhibition. It's been out of print for many years. And in the introduction, the man I mentioned much earlier on, Sheh Yahu Nia, uh, a real uh, hero of mine, uh, to, told told me what I'm telling you now that the, the, the caption had been uh, 
change. Um, it, the bigger issue behind these photographs, and it's on this point that I'm going to end, of course, it used to be denied that the Palestinians were expelled. The, the UN mediator at the time, Volker Bernadotte, uh, who was then assassinated in September, did not deny it. Uh, but Bernadotte's phrase, which is as true today as it was then in probably July 1948, was they either fled or were expelled. The Palestinians either fled or were expelled. That's it. And there's no more debate about the one than there is about the other. Some fled in the confusion of war. They thought we'd go for a short period, we'd be able to come back again because the Arab armies will sweep in and, and, and reverse the whole situation. But we have now two totally different sources of evidence to tell us, to show us that the expulsions took place. And one, of course, is the written work, the work that you as scholars are more familiar with, particularly the seminal work of Benny Morris, dating from 1987. Um, and we now have this, a second totally different source of evidence in these photographs, provided we can interpret them correctly. If we think these were Arabs being returned to Arab territory, then we think, well, there's no, there's no expulsion. By the way, and I'm shocked, I'm still shocked by this. And I, you will find some of the background to this in a brilliant book. I regard Ariella Azoulay, as the pioneer here, she wrote a little book of photographs called From Palestine to Israel, just over a decade ago. And she has uh, six or eight pictures by different photographers of the, the women of Tantura. And she pointed out, and I thought, I, I must be misreading this. This was witnessed by both the United Nations and the Red Cross. What? I'm trying to get my head around why the Israeli photographers were there. What did they think they were doing? What did they think they were recording? And for whom, for what purpose? What did the United Nations think they were doing? What did the Red Cross do? It was almost as if, and I think this is what the Zionists wanted at the time, that this was a sort of authorized expulsion, if, if such a thing is possible. And if you say to me, what's the acid test? Were they expelled or not? Did they go willingly or not? And there's not the shadow of a shadow of a doubt that they did not go willing, willingly. They were brought, having been moved around at least two or three times from Tantura, they were brought in the bus and told us where you go. Was there some kind of agreement, or you might say complicity with Jordanians on the other side? The Jordanians knew they were coming, and had found a place for them to go. Okay. None of this changes the fact, to my mind. Uh, you, you can argue with me if you want, tell me I'm wrong. An expulsion is an expulsion is an expulsion. Well, what I've tried to do is to, to show that uh, photographs can open up all kinds of windows on the story, which in its bare bones is a very, very familiar story. The actual nuts and bolts of the Israel-Palestine story. In the hundred years that I deal with, I've called it 1850. And the way I put it in the introduction to the book is that although um, images are like words in one important respect, they're never innocent, as I put it. That's to say they're never context-free, they're never floating in some context-free place. If this were fro floating in some context-free place, we would think, what's going on? We wouldn't. You have to reconstruct the story, really as well as trying to find out something about the photographer, if we possibly can. So although words and images are never innocent, as I put it, nevertheless, taken together, as I've tried to do in a book, and you've seen only a dozen pictures out of 122, <laughs> together they can have new dimensions to our understanding of the history, the geography, the sense of place, and perhaps above all, the human reality of Palestine. Thank you very much.